Now that we've talked more about India and China, you know, we really have to consider the reason why we talk so much about China is not only is it the second largest country in the world, not only is it a, a, a behemoth in terms of uh, hegem- hegemony, uh, and what is going to happen going forward in terms of how does the, the battle of the world take place and what happens on an economic level, but it drills down to food. You know, people need food, water, shelter. And, you know, when, when people will talk about, you know, what happens with war or to advance for war, war happens when you can't eat, when you can't drink, when you don't have safety. There's a certain amount that is always going to happen has happened through time. You know, one of the big things we said from the very beginning was hundreds of thousands will die from COVID, but millions will die from hunger. And we're seeing that play out. And the reason why we said that it was not just because of COVID and, and the issues that were that were happening with stressed economies, because that obviously is part of it where countries can't afford to maybe buy wheat or grains or things of that nature. But we also had swine flu. We also had army worm infestations. We also had locusts spreading throughout the, um, the world, which is really creating a bigger problem. So when you think about the general breakdown of food, it starts with poor, uh, it starts with beef, beef being the most expensive. So then you have beef. Then after beef, you have pork. After pork, you have chicken. So then once you, ex- once you exasperate the livestock, then you go down into the, the, the higher quality grains. So let's just break it down and keep it simple. Then you have beans, then you have corn, then you have wheat, then you have rice. So this is really where, when we look at things, you have to consider what is happening. We have done several videos on the Yangtze River. We have done several videos on what is happening within China. And what do they do? They, they experience destroyed livestock. They've experienced a massive outbreak of swine flu, which they still haven't gotten under control. And they've, they've lost a significant amount of grains to the, um, the flooding. So when we look at just looking at pork first, and then we'll start going into some of the softs, here are just some of the outbreaks since 2019. Now, Germany isn't on this, and we'll cover Germany separately, but here's just an example of the outbreak since 2019. And obviously, you can see uh, China on there in uh, August in uh, 2018, but again, they had another outbreak in 2020. This is a big problem because you have to cull or kill the whole herd, or at least those that are in proximity, in order to keep this from spreading. Now, Pigs can have litters. It's not like a cow that has a calf and then it takes time to get that livestock back out. But at the same time, it takes feed. You have to feed the livestock. You have to do things to to bring, to bring this back to normal. And the problem is, one, it's expensive. And two, it also takes grain away from the market that could feed people to give it to an animal. So typically you have a, a, a quality of life thing, uh, set up where as your quality of life gets, gets better, as you become a wealthier nation, you eat more meat. And so this is a, a, you know, something China experienced. They, they've gotten wealthier, they've seen their growth, so they, ex- they expected more meat. And what did you have? You had a huge explosion in meat prices. So the most recent in- increase was Germany. So Germany is the largest output of pig meat producers of uh, last year when you look at the EU and they just had a positive swine flu uh, carcass. It was wild boar. Uh, there's There was another four or five that were found within the same area. And this has resulted in additional pork uh, imports being cut, China cutting, you know, Brazil has had their issues in terms of getting things back into China and throughout the world. And this is just another shortage that's coming and hitting. And you're seeing it really reflect not only in Europe when you think about, you know, where pork demand is, but China also has a huge pork demand. And that's why when we look at, you know, this, the the title for this one is called Pork Lover. You can see that just the amount of imports coming from, uh, coming to China. So you can see in 2019, when they had the huge increase in, uh, in swine flu, that was when they had to increase their imports. They had to thaw out their, um, their frozen reserves. And this has really started to see this big increase. And that's something where you saw that spike. Now, the other problem was locusts were obviously hit. Africa and in Asia in terms of just how severe the swarms were, but you also had the army worm outbreaks 
in two parts of China, which in one of in the northern sector has never seen that before. An army worm is just a worm that can get into the crop and then it just spreads like wildfire, which becomes a bigger problem as we've seen those shortfalls. So now you have a situation where countries don't have money or because they're trying to stimulate the economy, support other things. So what are they, what can't they do? Subsidize food. So that means that the food expense is going up. You know, we did a, a, a show showing that in the past, 60 cents of every dollar in emerging market was going to uh, going to food. And now we're up to 85 and even close to 90 cents for every dollar going to food in a lot of these areas. And we cover it in the econ show in terms of the US, how much is the US spending on food, especially across different tiers. And the pain continues to grow because the demand is growing abroad. So by doing that, you're just seeing the prices going up on a global level, which is one of the reasons why we've talked so much about bean, uh, soybeans, corn, and pork. So now when we look at just the U.S., so this is what the USDA put out when we look at exports. So the one on the left is exports, you know, as we're looking at it from the normal season in terms of recent, you can see that exports continue to rise as we look at versus a year ago. Now, there was a little bit of a takedown week over week. This is due to timing. This is due to harvest. There's a lot of things that come into what makes this up, but you can see on a yearly change, it's massive. And the yearly change is because there's so much going abroad. You're seeing additional amount. China has been just a sweeping buyer. And let's be fair. The trade deal has nothing to do with it. Now, it's good, it's nice because they can fill a void, which they're, they've been, you know, they're, let's call it 45% below where they should be on an agricultural level. So this will help close that gap. But it's because they have such a shortfall at home that they're just essentially sweeping the market trying to close that gap. Now, that's just looking at it on a week over week level, looking at the different levels now that we're coming up to the new harvest, which has already begun. But we're also seeing that year to date. The year to date, you just have to look at the changes in terms of, you know, corn, 28 uh, 28 to 29%, soybeans, you know, close to 49%. These are things that we're going to continue to see, and it's only driving prices within the U.S. and other areas higher. So just, you know, taking that to a different perspective and looking at rice, around 49.5 million tons of rice is estimated to be procured in the, in the forthcoming Karif season as we're looking at India. In 2019 to 2020, this season, the country had a record rice procurement, which is good in terms of trying to get that, some of that shortfall. But you might think, oh, well, they, they had a, a record rice, but Thailand had a record low. Vietnam has, has been struggling. So it's just making up for the shortfall. But the problem is without pork, without beef, you have to, again, go down that scale that we outlined earlier. So if I can't get pork, well, what about chicken? Well, then chicken prices go up. And then after chicken prices go up, what about beans? Then, bite, then bean prices go up. And you can see how it continues to go down that chain. So rice is supposed to be that cheap staple that everybody can afford, but yet the prices are starting to creep higher as well. And that leads us to where the, you now this is just looking at where is U.S. Um, pr product going? What is the breakdown? And you can see just how where China falls on all of these pieces. Now, just to be clear on wheat, we have a, a large you know, wheat pr uh, production, but so does Russia, so does the Ukraine. So when you look at just where does a lot of this come from, it really doesn't have to originate in the U.S. where beans you're you're looking at you know who is the largest exporter of beans? Well, it's uh, it's um, Brazil. After Brazil, it's the U.S. And then you have you know Argentina. You have other parts of of Europe. But again, the U.S. is is really being the big driver of where a lot of this product is going as the grain inspections you know continue to move out. Corn, we remain one of the largest, depending on the year, uh, largest exporter of corn, and we're obviously a big exporter of wheat. So this is why it's so important, because you have a huge amount of exports leaving the U.S., going to the open market due to the price um, The price. Uh, the price is beneficial to the farmer. It makes sense to go abroad, but we also have an internal problem. You know, we, you know, we've covered on multiple occasions the problems that the consumer is having within the U.S. So when we look at the U.S., this is just looking at the U.S. household hunger before and during the pandemic. And here you can see this is this is obviously based on 
you know, the, the racial profiling, you uh, not, I shouldn't say racial profiling, but the racial backdrop in terms of who has the least security, where is this happening? So we look at all households, you can see that, you know, Weekly average during the pandemic, uh, you're we're at 10.5 percent. This was already a problem, and it's only getting worse. And that's why when when we go into the minorities, you can see that it's only getting worse in those levels. So when you look at the looting and you look at the 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 social discourse, there's a lot behind that. Yes, we're seeing the outcropping of it, but it, there's there's a lot driving that. There's social mobility inability. There's no there's a limited social mobility. There's a hunger factor. There's a disenfranchised factor that is really being picked up here. And now some key kind of like anecdotal pieces when we look at Nourish Pierce County, when when we look at Washington, you know, they're talking about the numbers are way up. Where in June and May alone, they served one million meals which is a 50% increase year over year. You know, the one food bank CEO has said that one in five Washingtonians will help, will need help putting food on their table. So we have to consider, you know, back to school, back to school is food, you know, kids rely on that food. How do you supplement that? You know, the pain is real and it's at home and the prices continue to go up, not because of just, you know, the exports, but also Crops were damaged. We had a windstorm that ripped through the Midwest, knocked over silos, you know, destroyed some farms. So the the amount of crops that are available, you know, we were supposed to have a bumper crop. It's not a bumper crop anymore. Bumper crop being just, you know, they, they have spare capacity to be stored. So this is a growing issue. Now we'll take it to the next level and look at the U.S. versus other food insecure populations on high income, uh, you know, countries. The U.S. is is the, one of the highest as percent of population that cannot afford an energy sufficient diet. Now, you know, when we start looking at different things, we have to start understanding, you know, what is the backdrop? What does this mean? Because the U.S. has a lot of programs involved, but the programs cost money on a federal and state level. And we've talked about budgets. We've talked about loss of tax income. So this is a big problem, especially when like state officials say that 2 million people in our state each month are being fed by food bank and other assistance programs, again, looking at Washington. And this is this is not just a Washington issue, not to just pick on them, just because it was a, uh, a the, one of the more recent um, uh Articles. It's just this is a a national problem. It's just it, there is a lot that needs to be done, and the pricing that we're seeing is only going to make things worse. Now, when we start looking at it you know, from the from the view of children, as we talked about going back to school, what happens with school? You can see the reported food insufficiency this summer. It continued to climb, and it and it, again, it's you know people losing their jobs, and, you know, not having uh, that that's that income, that extra income that the on the fiscal stimulus side. This is all happening within this construct, and you're starting to see that pain increase as we went through the remainder of the year. And now, you know, given that we were picking on Washington before, now we can look at food insecurity across the whole U.S. Now, this is before we even get into COVID and the other issues and some impacts from price increases, inflation that, you know, apparently doesn't exist, depending on how you calculate it. You know, even though we've, I can show you and I will show you on bean prices, how they've increased over time. There are, there is a significant problem in a lot of these areas where, you know, you're either near or above U.S. averages and you can see it getting worse and worse. And this has continued to spread. In one of the econ shows, we had this broken down based on during the pandemic. And you can see that a lot of areas across the Midwest and especially the South and growing in the Northeast continue to struggle with food, uh, with food security, which is again going to become a bigger problem as we continue to, to face an uphill battle on an economic level. And this is just looking at soybean prices. So this is just looking at the fact that we're at a uh, near essentially all time high in terms of soybean prices for the November contract. We've had peaks in in um, in soybean prices and other contracts. This specific contract tends is actually at one of the highest, and you can see the parabolic move it's had as people are pricing in not only inflation but also the increased demand from abroad as well as internally. Because beans is a is a great way to find protein outside of meat, so this is why one of those big supplements is so key. So when we you know, just kind of like rounding it out, when we're looking at the different perspectives, because we did a lot of different pieces, rice exports from India, the world's biggest shipper, will recover this year. But again, because they have a weaker raw rupee and they have a bigger crop, but make shipments attractively priced into Africa and parts of Asia, overseas sales will climb to about twelve million this year. 
as Indian exports continue to be cheaper than rivals, uh, but the rivals being Thailand, Vietnam, and Pakistan, because Thailand and Vietnam have had weaker crops, you know, they are facing bigger issues. And then you have to think about, well, what about my food security? I need to prov- make sure I have enough food for my own populace. So then you have a certain amount of, um, of nationalism and, and locking and putting barriers on exports and limiting exports or putting uh, export quotas to ensure that you have enough food, which is, again, just going to exasperate the issue, especially as we go uh, go abroad. And this is something that, as it, you know, people ask, you know, what drives us to, to war? What drives us to conflict? And when, you know, some of the, the lines from... Uh, from the book Lords of Finance is when you go to war, you put a, you put aside finance, you know, you put aside rational thinking when you're going to war because there's a lot of emotion, there's a lot of heat in that battle, and and it's really driven to, you know, the, as the as the saying goes, like it's not that I hate the people, the person in front of me, it's that I love the people behind me. And that's what you're. That's that's what some of these people are viewing. That they're they're trying to protect the ones that they love. And it's not that they hate the person across the, the across the border. Or it's that they want to feed the ones that they love. And I don't know you, but you have food. And that's why we we have to be respectful and understand that there is a lot of dynamics that we may not appreciate in the U.S. in terms of you know what we have and, and the stability that we have. But these are real problems that are going to continue to drive not only in the inflation question, but also as we go further into the um in, into the uh the security side. So it's something we're gonna always be paying attention to and appreciate. So thanks again for watching. Uh you know depending on when this comes out, uh have a great weekend. You know ideally we'll we'll see you again next week when we talk more about uh inflation and then we have our normal uh agenda of our conversations episode, which will be launched on Monday, which is we're going to look at commercial real estate. Then we're going to have our EIA show, our economy show, and then our favorite, the primary vision for spread count. So thanks again for watching. I'm Mark Rosano, founder and CEO of C6 Capital Holdings, coming to you from Primary Vision Network. <laughs>